Good evening, everyone. I am Shreya Atre. I'm an associate professor in international human rights law at the Faculty of Law at Oxford and a welfare dean and the racial justice and equality fellow at Kerala College. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the third Black History Month annual lecture here at Kellogg. We began the Black History Month by launching the Black Women at Oxford exhibition last week. Last week, the curator, Dr. Purvi Khetan, has added five more fascinating women to the exhibition this year. Urbi is present with us here today. Thank you, Urbi, once again for opening up the exhibition for us. After the lecture and for the rest of the month, please do have a look around for what is a rare but a much needed reminder of the history of Black women's participation in Oxford. This exhibition accompanies our flagship event marking the Black History Month, which is our annual lecture. Our first Black History Month annual lecture in 2021 was delivered by Professor Jason R. Day, who earlier this year was appointed as the youngest ever Black professor at Cambridge. And our second Black History Month annual lecture in 2022 was delivered by Professor Iona Solanke, who's here with us today, who is the first Black woman to hold a statutory chair at the Faculty of Law at Oxford. Our third Black History Month annual lecture today, I'm pleased to say, is being delivered by someone as illustrious as our former speakers, but also someone whom I must credit to have brought this lecture into being in the first place. Our speaker today is one of the founders of the Rhodes Must Fall movement at Oxford, and one of the key leaders of the movement to decolonize Oxford and broadly Britain, a movement which gained prominence after the June 2020 protests that followed the murder of George Floyd. The more local wave of radical change that followed those protests in Oxford led for initiatives such as this one to be created. It is thus my honor to introduce you to Professor Simakai Chigaru, who will be delivering tonight's lecture. Simakai is an associate professor of African politics based at Oxford Department of International Development. He's a fellow of St. Anthony's College. His work on politics of global health and epidemics, race and identity, citizenship and activist movements with a regional focus on Africa and African diaspora has been captured best in his book titled The Political Life of an Epidemic, Cholera, Crisis and Citizenship in Zimbabwe. The book was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. It examined the social and political causes and consequences of Zimbabwe's catastrophic cholera outbreak in 2008 and 2009, the most extensive in African history. The book has won the Theodore J. Lowy First Book Prize from the African sorry, the American and International Political Science Associations. Simukai's garden essay, which is titled My Life in the Shadow of Cecil Rhodes, has been read widely and appreciated very widely. He wrote in that essay, Oxford, Britain, and the West must be decolonized. Essential to this is advancing a richer, more complex view of the imperial past and its bearing on the present. If anyone has not read the essay, I highly recommend it to you. But first, we get a chance to hear from Sumakai himself. Thank you, Sumakai, for agreeing to deliver the 2023 Black History Month annual lecture at Kellogg. The floor is all yours. Thank you for that extremely kind introduction and perhaps overstating my um, significance in some of these anti-colonial efforts, but I appreciate it all the same. 
Every work of literature has both a situation and a story, writes the critic Vivian Gornick. The situation is the context or circumstance, sometimes the plot. The story is the emotional experience that preoccupies the writer, the insight, the wisdom, the thing one has come to say. I first thought about writing a creative nonfiction book titled, When Will We Be Free? during the anti-racist uprisings of 2020. As we know, the public mood in Britain at the time was one of reckoning with its colonial past. Having been a keen participant in activist movements like Roads Must Fall, and as one of the few black professors at Oxford University, uh, at last count, I think there were 11 of us out of 1,952. I believed I had something to say. I wanted to tell an epic story about colonialism and its aftermath with my family at the center of it. I wanted to write about the land stolen from my ancestors in what is today called Zimbabwe. About my parents' involvement in the liberation wars against settler colonialism in Southern Africa. About the promise and frustrated hopes of African independence. And about Britain's whitewashing of its colonial history. I saw this backdrop as crucial to our understanding of how the colonial past shapes the present and what it might mean to decolonize, to finally be free from the legacies of empire. But undertaking this project has evoked something more complicated and submerged, a reckoning with how the ghosts of the past show up, not only in our politics, but in our psyches too in both our collective and individual notions of who we are, how they haunt us in ways we cannot always see. Been interviewing for my, my parents for this book and talking to them elicits the pain of loss and dispossession. Their wounds are raw and untended and it's led them to an intractable form of denial about grief from the past, about Zimbabwe's post-colonial trajectory, and about uncomfortable feelings of guilt and of uncertainty and shame that run through the family. This is a complicated familial inheritance. And through the slow, patient process working through my family history, it's become clear to me that a guiding thread through this book is intergenerational trauma and hopefully transformation. And so the book is taking shape as a story that is simultaneously about collective freedom from the afterlives of colonialism and freedom of the self from the fractious despair of a troubled family. These themes are woven together like the strands of a double helix, inseparable without being reducible to one or the other. Now, there are many scenes I could share from the book, but today I'm gonna to narrow my focus and I want to talk about fathers, sons, and the history that sits between them. My father's father belonged to the social class called migrant laborers. In the early 20th century, when black labor in Southern Africa was forced to a cheap and resembled bondage or modern slavery, black men migrated for work throughout the region. Now, there is something dissatisfying something sanitized and concealing about the word migrated in this context. It doesn't quite capture the ceaseless rotation of black workers shipped like cargo in the boxcars of steam driven locomotives to toil in the mines of South Africa. It doesn't capture the backbreaking labor, the digging and the drilling deep down in the belly of the earth, the shiny evasive stones before dying at atrocious rates from tuberculosis. It doesn't capture the exhausting tedium of picking tomatoes or cotton or fruit or tobacco on the plantations of white-owned farmers under the scornful glare of the white foreman and under the scorching glare of a white hot sun. It doesn't capture the smell of unwashed bodies and untended festering wounds in the overcrowded workers' barracks. It doesn't capture the loneliness of separation from mothers and children. My grandfather was one of the luckier ones. He started working when he was about nine years old, but that was a, as a domestic worker on a farm in Rhodesia, the colony named after Oxford's favorite son, 
says St. John Rhodes. They call my grandfather a houseboy, a term for a black male of any age working as a fat totem for a white employer. You see, racism has a habit of treating children as adults and adults as children. Still, for all its indignities, the life of a houseboy was less punishing than life on the mines or on the plantations. In 1919, as a young man, my grandfather left Rhodesia for South Africa. He worked in Kimberley, Port Elizabeth, Johannesburg, and Cape Town before returning to Salisbury, Rhodesia's capital, where his South African work credentials gained him employment as a waiter and cook in the city's finest hotels. And perhaps it goes without saying, but these hotels only served white people. Now it was during this stint that he was granted living quarters, a dingy bungalow in a black only township on the outskirts of Salisbury. These houses were designated for migrant laborers who moved from their so-called rural homes to work in the city. From time to time, my father, my grandmother, my father's older siblings would cram themselves into this house to stay with my grandfather for weekends or days on end. The family lost that house when my grandfather was arrested in 1965. But my father still speaks of it to me in honeyed tones when he laments the severed link to the past. The home my father remembers most clearly was his family's rural house a brick and iron structure in an arid village surrounded by vast open woodlands and dry Sasa trees. The family had been forcibly moved there by the Rhodesian government in 1947, four years before my father was born. See, across southern Rhodesia, the colonial government had confiscated the country's most fertile terrain. They dispossessed black people and gave their land to white settlers to establish ranches and large commercial farms. The evicted black people were confined to so-called tribal trust lands. And even though my father was born after the, the eviction, he inherited his family's mournful attachment to the home he never knew and his family's fearsome disdain for the government that displaced them. The Africa of my father's childhood teetered on the fulcrum of historical change. He was five years old when the first sub-Saharan African nation gained independence from colonial rule at midnight on March 6, 1957. Wearing a white skull cap, Kwame Nkrumah mounted a small wooden platform to address a large ululating crowd in a cross parliament square. Under the dazzle of flood lights, with tears streaming down his face, Nkrumah announced the independence of the Gold Coast, renamed Ghana, in homage to the West African Empire. The Union flag was lowered and a new flag of red, green and gold was hoisted in its place. The moment of freedom had arrived, Nkrumah declared. 1957 marked the birth of a new Africa, and I quote, ready to fight its own battles and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. It had taken a decade of strikes, boycotts and civil disobedience for Ghana to gain independence. But this was only one battle in the war for African emancipation. Our independence, Nkrumah said, is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. To be sure, in North Africa, decolonization was already underway. The previous year had seen Sudan, Morocco and Tunisia acquire independence while a war for independence was raging in Algeria. But the independence of Ghana, only the fourth black nation state in the world after Haiti, Liberia, and Ethiopia was a signal event in the black Atlantic. Nkrumah's audience that night included Martin Luther King and his wife, Coretta Scott King, nationalists from across the African continent like Julius Nyerere of Tanzania also participated in the Independence Day celebrations. Barred from traveling to Ghana because the United States had revoked his passport, the African-American intellectual, uh, pictured on your right, and civil rights activist W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a public letter to Nkrumah and the Ghanaian people, congratulating them on a hard-won independence and encouraging the new country to don the mantle of the Pan-African movement that he had helped to foster since the turn of the 20th century. 
Ghana's independence had arrived mere months after the year-long boycott of the public transit system by African-Americans in Montgomery, Alabama. For the likes of Du Bois and King, the efforts of maids and gardeners in Montgomery to walk miles in heat and rain singing, we shall overcome, despite intimidation and harassment, was contiguous with Ghanaian independence as the beginnings of a global struggle for racial equality. Captivated by Nkrumah's fiery charisma was a young Robert Mugabe, who had moved to Ghana in 1958. Mugabe attended the first All Africa People's Conference, a gathering of Pan-Africanist ideologues from 28 countries and colonies strategizing for freedom continent-wide. It was here that Mugabe began to think seriously about how African nationalism and Marxism could end colonial rule in Southern Rhodesia and bring about a new vision of society. But Mugabe was not the only one invigorated by African nationalism. So too were my grandfather and my uncle Tine, nine years my father's senior. By the early 60s, both men had joined the leading national party at the time, the Zimbabwe African People's Union, or ZAPU. My uncle Tine went a step further and joined ZAPU's armed wing. His was a steely determination to take down the Rhodesian government by any means necessary. The white minority governments of Southern Africa had other ideas. As the first waves of decolonization swept through Africa, the European settler populations of South Africa, Southwest Africa, Rhodesia, and the Lusophone colonies of Angola and Mozambique all tightened control of their colonies, determined to bring African nationalism to a halt and to keep power and wealth in white hands. To them, African leadership augured disaster. Meanwhile, the British government conceded that maintaining their colonies in Southern Africa was too expensive, and indeed that there was no stemming the tide of African independence. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan traveled to South Africa in 1960 and warned the apartheid state and its white nationalist neighbors that the wind of change is blowing through this continent. Whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact. The Macmillan government and its immediate successors made the pragmatic decision to support Southern Rhodesia's independence from the British Empire on the condition of unimpeded progress to majority rule and an end to racial discrimination. Pressure on Southern Rhodesia was mounting. African protest against unfair treatment under colonial rule escalated from messy, uncoordinated campaigns into more militant nationalism, demanding one man, one vote. The threat of violent nationalism provoked a backlash. Southern Rhodesia renamed Rhodesia when the government took a hard turn to the right as the white supremacist Rhodesian Front Party was elected to power. At its helm, as prime minister of Rhodesia from 1964 was an unlikely hero. A politician of previously colorless record, a simple man, shorn of humor and emotion, a dull speaker with a limited and repetitive vocabulary as lacking in charisma as he was in fashion sense, <laughs> an anti-intellectual who preferred cricket to books, and as it turned out, a tactically astute and bitterly racist demagogue who personified the motto, Rhodesians never die. Ian Smith and his supporters called themselves pioneers, the only true Britons left Spartans, the last good white men standing, as African as any black man, a unique breed of men whose example will go some way towards redeeming the squalid and shameful times in which we live. The Rhodesian national anthem, stately and august, evokes solemnity and power in its visions of greatness, of godliness, of being on the right side of history. The Rhodesian front felt betrayed by Britain. As they saw it, the mother country had abandoned its empire and its values and was all too ready to overlook military dictatorship and civil war in black Africa while condemning Rhodesian society for not acceding to calls for African independence. <laughs> 
If Churchill were alive today, Smith said, I believe he would probably emigrate to Rhodesia because I believe that all those admirable qualities and characteristics that we believed in, loved and preached to our children no longer exist in Britain. For my father, the year 1965, when the Smith government was getting ready to break away from Britain was the most difficult time. Says my father, I was 14 years old, but I was still in primary school. That year, my father was arrested. My sister was arrested. My brother, Ruocha, who you can see in the back row on the right, was arrested. Tine, my other brother standing next to him, had already left the, the country for training in North Korea. But when he came back, he too was arrested. My uncle Tine had gone to North Korea to learn arm infiltration and intelligence gathering in guerrilla warfare. Men like him activated the Rhodesian fear that lurking in the shadows of Europe's declining power in Africa was the insidious advance of communism. Communists, they said, were using African nationalists as a Trojan horse to sack the colonial Troy and capture Southern Africa's vast mineral riches. The Rhodesian government harassed, imprisoned, and banned African political activists in a bid to fortify Southern Africa as an impregnable bastion of white power. Tine was identified by, as a terrorist by an informer, an African spy working for the Rhodesian state who had infiltrated the nationalist movement. My uncle went to prison age 23 and remained in captivity for 12 years. The story my father would tell me about his conversion from innocent child to freedom fighter has a fabulous quality to it. By this, I don't mean to say that he's being dishonest, far from it. What I mean is that his storytelling is driven by a kind of unambiguous morality. He draws clear dividing lines. There are heroes who fight for the nation and anyone who stands in the way is a villain. Whether he's conscious of it or not, my father endows his story with symbolism and revelation, with linear causality and progression to the telos of self-vindication. His is as much an account of the past as it is a statement about the man he is in the present. It's the story that he wants, that he needs me to believe. If ever I'm to understand his loyalties to the country and the sacrifices he says he has made in my name. To dwell in this story, is to see my father as, and, and to understand the world as he sees it or wants to see it. And that story goes something like this. On November 11th, 1965, Rhodesia unilaterally declared independence from Britain, an undertaking that the Rhodesian front compared to the United States Declaration of Independence some 200 years before. About three weeks later, Towards the end of November, my grandfather left his village home to attend a neighbor's funeral. On the way back, my grandfather's party was ambushed. Through the help of an informer, Rhodesia police identified my grandfather as a nationalist with Zapu. They beat him up, roped him to a motorbike, and took him to a holding cell in the nearest town. My father waited at home that evening for my grandfather to return. One evening turned into another, then another, then another. For two weeks, my father and his family heard nothing. This is life in a country at war. The fear of disaster stalks you, grabs you, sinks its claws into you and refuses to let you go. Finally, a gray Land Rover rolled into the village. Its doors opened, letting out the familiar hum of a police radio. A bevy of white police officers pulled my grandfather out of the vehicle and dumped him to the ground. Disheveled, frightened, covered in dust, my grandfather scrambled to his feet. He was told to get a few clothes from the house to chop chop. My father saw my grandfather but couldn't talk to him. 
the police shoved my grandfather as my father approached them. They bundled my grandfather into the car and just like that, they were gone. The entire episode now exists in my father's memory as a bad dream, paradoxically ephemeral and enduring, a distillation of the fear he felt at the tender age of 14. The police took my grandfather to the country's largest detention site, Gonakudzingwa, where the banished ones sleep. On arrival, my grandfather was greeted by an aimless congregation of tin huts and boreholes, bounded on the east by the Mozambican border, hundreds of miles from any town, and everywhere surrounded by a dark and howling wilderness where lions and elephants roam free. He was thrown into a small cell with walls of corrugated metal. The heat was sweltering during the day. The cold was biting and bullying at night. When rain fell, the detention site turned from the thickest of dust to the direst of mud. In 1966, my father finally started his secondary education at Murawa High School in the Northeast of the country, founded by Methodist missionaries. My grandfather had left behind enough savings to pay school fees for my father's first year. But by 1967, as my father started his second year of high school, the family savings ran out. There wasn't a penny left. The missionaries took pity on my father. They allowed him to continue his schooling if he, uh, if he agreed to do maintenance work on the school grounds during the holidays. My father was bright, though wan and sensitive as a boy. He was the youngest in the family, you know, the special child, the one indulged by his parents and coddled by his sisters. He struggled to settle into Murewa. Its strict code of conduct was designed to breed men, not boys like my father with manners like flowers. In the holiday months of April, August, and December, my father would not go home. He worked for his tuition, mixing cement or stumping trees or polishing floors, or when he was lucky, filing away paperwork. One day in August, 1968, my father was plowing the school fields. A classmate hurried over to him, eager and breathless. Edgar, the boy said. The missionaries insisted on the use of Christian mm -hmm. names. Your father has been released. My father begged for an excusal from the school to go back home and hug my grandfather. He took a bus from Murewa for the township nearest to home. He walked briskly from the bus stop then sped up into a light job before breaking into a full stride sprint once the house came into view. Drowning in an oversized hand-me-down maroon sweater, dripping with sweat, he threw his arms around my grandfather. I saw him, he saw me, we hugged each other, that was it. My uncle Tine was still in prison, and the other siblings had scattered around the country. My father was the only one of his parents' children there to welcome my grandfather back from detention. My father stayed home for the next three days, one day for each year that my grandfather had been in prison before he returned to school and resumed his manual work. What happened in those few days together? What did my grandfather say about his detention? What did he convey to my father about the battles unfolding in the country? I have no picture of my grandfather's inner life. He is as mythical to me as the downtrodden Israelites of the Old Testament. As for my father, there is something potent, something torrid if elusive in his recollection of this time. My father's story is flushed with feelings beyond his ability to communicate. And I can almost feel in myself his anger, compassion, sorrow, failure, disgust, resentment, betrayal, love, all surging and crashing like waves within him. But the man I grew up with was not one to give himself over to his feelings. And so I tried to imagine him back then, barely 17 years old, lost and frightened in a hard country, 
if he felt vulnerable or confused, that this is not what he wished to, to tell me. Instead, he speaks of this moment of existential terror as a clarifying Damascene turning point in which his internal tumult hardened into political conviction. Back at school, my father came into his own. He won a scholarship for academic excellence, which covered the costs of his tuition. He distinguished himself as a long distance runner, became one of those popular boys at school and was elected chairman of the student Christian movement. Now, the greatest honor of the chair was to deliver a sermon on one Sunday of the year to the entire Methodist congregation in the Brewer district. My father tells me that he sees this opportunity to preach from the gospel according to Matthew. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. As a matter of fact, my father held little religious conviction. He saw Christianity's arrival in Africa as a paradox. For centuries, white rulers claimed moral virtue and superior knowledge of God, and yet they dispossessed, enslaved, imprisoned, infantilized, and dehumanized fellow human beings in a way that my father could only describe as evil. But to be persecuted by the Rhodesian re regime, my father now pronounced from the pulpit, was a blessed call to arms because righteousness was on the side of the black man. My father claimed the truth. He knew the enemy. His cause was just. By 1971, under the spell of high fever, the Rhodesian government had detained, exiled, or silenced the most prominent African nationalists. Years of negotiation between the Brits and the Rhodes offered limited concession to majority rule. Guerrilla attacks against the Smith government grew more widespread. In the same year, my father was one of only three students from Wurewa to pass his national O-level examinations well enough to continue to his A-levels the last two years of high school, which he would complete at Teguani High School at the opposite end of the country in the Southwest. At Teguani, my father read at a frantic pace from library books and pamphlets illuminated by the blue flame of a paraffin lamp he absorbed new political ideas about liberation and struggle from Cuba, Chile, the West Indies, the Soviet Union, and other parts of Africa. He had only been at Tiguani a matter of months when he says he was summoned to a clandestine meeting down by the river behind the school. The main reason why the African people, especially the youth, can now resort to violence is because they are not allowed a word, not a word in politics, said a young man, a guerrilla soldier, there to recruit the boys of Teguani into a demonstration against Ian Smith's government. In a country of six million, white people who made up less than 5% of the population outnumbered black people 20 to one in all political representation. My father listened intently at the river meeting where a plan was formulated to seize the attention of a British delegation in Rhodesia. Lord Goodman and his team had arrived in the rebel colony to meet Smith's representatives about more concessions toward black majority rule. This is our message, said the soldier at the river. The only way to reason with Smith is to use violence. That is violence in the valley. And the Africans, we will do it since the British government has refused to use violence. Maybe tomorrow I'll be behind bars and I don't mind. I am prepared to make such sacrifices and even greater sacrifices for the freedom of the country. Are you? Teguani was among three schools where boys were rallied to demonstrate against racial discrimination. My father and his comrades left the school at 3 a.m and marched for eight miles to the nearest town of Plum Tree. They held defiant placards that read, Zimbabwe will be free. Within moments of entering the city, squads of policemen descended upon them like torrential rain. Barking police dogs, vicious German shepherds surrounded the protesters in a wide cordon and the police threw tear gas canisters into the crowd. <laughs> 
My father and a hundred other screaming boys were rounded up into the police cars and taken to court. He was sentenced to corporal punishment because the Rhodesian government didn't believe in locking up minors. My father spent the night in prison, stuffed into a cell with 18 other boys he couldn't sleep, uncertain and fearful about the next day's punishment. In the morning, as the dawn's pale light peered through the cell's high window to soften the shock of darkness, the boys began to stir. The punishment would commence soon. One prisoner climbed on the shoulders of another and the pair leaned against the wall, edging their way to the high window. The lookout on top examined the courtyard scene below to gauge what awaited them. He shouted down to everyone's relief, it's not so bad. He was wrong. My father was summoned from the cell and taken to a holding room with another, prince, with another prisoner. There, the police stripped both boys naked. A prison guard wrapped itchy, threadbare cloths over their midriffs and buttocks. At that moment, a banshee cry from the courtyard, high-pitched and blood-curdling, stabbed the air. My father gasped. The first round of caning had been delivered by the police, but as my father was preparing for his beating, he says a helicopter landed near the prison yard. It delivered what he calls the professionals, his own sinister and clinical code word for the men who apparently specialized in caning prisoners. When it was his turn, a prison guard led my father out of the holding room through to the courtyard to a large trapezium-shaped table made of heavy sun-bleached wood. Bend over and spread out, the prison guard said. My father prostrated his upper half over the table, his limbs splayed out like a starfish. The prison guard tied him down with disturbingly meticulous care. You're going to count for me, Kafra, said the professional. One. My father croaked, his voice husky with vulnerability. The cane sliced across his buttocks. Ah! The air vacated his lungs. His chest tightened. A tingling sensation coursed up and down his spine. Sweat ran over his body like a colony of ants. Percussive sound pounded in his ear. I said, you're going to fucking count for me, Kappa. The word too had barely escaped my father's lips when the cane sliced across his buttocks again. Rivers of, rivers of sweat and rivers of blood poured in confluence down his legs. By the fifth stroke of the cane, my father was delirious. His voice had muted, his vision blurred, the color in his skin drained away. Fuck, he muttered to himself. After the final caning, a prison guard untied his limp body. Once free, my father jolted back to life. With a burst of energy, he ran. He bolted to a tap at the other end of the courtyard. He wanted water. In a flash, the, prep, the professional who had came to him emerged from the crowd, stared my father down. My father says he looked into those dull and hateful eyes, froze dead in his tracks. There would be no water for him. He trundled back to the prison cell helpless, humiliated, and so parched he felt he might choke on clumps of dry air. The prisoners were discharged later that day and told to walk the eight miles back to Teguani. I've never experienced such a thing, my father tells me, still wincing at the memory, de memory decades later. And I, listening to this story, felt that something had passed between us, something complex and difficult to articulate. My father's story was so vivid in its horror that I wanted to write in these pages that I felt numb, but this is not quite right. What I actually felt was titillated. It was as if I were a child again, 
sitting with him in the car on the way to school, hanging on his every word, listening with rapt attention to his stories, his stories of Muhammad Ali and Pele, those proud men whose dark skin and athletic prowess stunned the world, listening to his stories of Tracy Chapman and her implacable yearning for black liberation, listening to his stories of generational struggles against the evils of colonialism and the great inheritance that had been handed down to him. His, story, his storytelling as a child always cast a spell on me and it had done so again. And yet, yet there's something that bothers me. You see, I'm not sure if my father is a good witness to the ordeal he suffered. The experience of torture, or in this case, corporal punishment caning, is so often ineffable. It is an evisceration of personhood, a breakdown of the self. To be tortured is a fragmented and disorienting experience that is hard to convey in narrative. And to do so, that is to place a coherent self in the story one tells, as my father did, is to tell a heavily reconstructed story. In this case, my father's story was intended to elicit in me a sense of awe at his political coming of age and an indebtedness too, a duty to prove myself worthy of his sacrifices, to follow in his footsteps as an unwavering nationalist. Our conversation continued. He would go on to tell me about his brief time as a student at the University of Rhodesia, where he was arrested again for taking part in protest against the government. After his second prison sentence, he went into exile in Uganda for three years, which is where he met my mother. He left her to join the liberation struggle and fought as a guerrilla in the dense green forests of Mozambique. He told me of his time on the battlefields of Chimoy and Muzingazi, where the roadies dropped napalm bombs on soldiers and civilians indiscriminately. The bodies of his comrades splattered all around him. He told me that he believed that he was dying, perhaps that he was already dead. He told me of his time in Romania, the tail end of the war, where he had been sent to study economics in anticipation of joining the civil servants once Zimbabwe had finally gained independence. And it was in Romania that my father received a telegram from his older brother, my uncle Tine, now out of prison, that said, our father, my grandfather, is no more. My grandfather had been sold out to the roadies by an informer. And just like the ambush in 1965, that landed him in prison for three years, my grandfather was abducted about four kilometers from his village home. I've tried and I have failed as best I can to reconstruct this scene. How did my grandfather react when a gun was raised to him? Did he plead for his life or was he resigned to his doom? Did his voice hold steady or did it crack with fright? Did the killers stand behind him or did they look him in the eye? I don't know if any of this matters when the granite truth is that they shot him in cold blood and jettisoned his remains in a shallow pit. My father has told me about my grandfather countless times, but always at a remove. He tells me that my grandfather was literate and driven, that he cared for his children and believed in self-improvement through education. But I have no sense of the man beyond these broad brush strokes and a sepia tinted photograph that sat on the mantelpiece in our living room. The struggle for Zimbabwe's liberation was the crucible through which my father's selfhood has been forged. And it is this fact more than any other that he wants me to know. When we talk, he underscores the brutality he endured at the hands of the roadies. And I feel the weight of history, my life as the gift of his having survived colossal violence. But too often it feels as if he has remained stuck in time, unable or unwilling to look honestly at what the country has become since, unable or unwilling to talk to me in any depth about anything other than the struggle. For in my father's quivering insistence that because of what he went through, I should share his fealty to the ruling party lies a strain in our relationship that has taken me a long time to understand. Even in moments of vulnerability, our relationship is still freighted with political expectations. <laughs>
but I've had to confront the fact that I've grown up in a different historical moment as part of the first generation one after Zimbabwe's independence in 1980, and I did not live under direct colonial rule. The Zimbabwe I know has been independent for four decades, four tumultuous decades. Now, there is no easy way to sum up the country's tra trajectory, and I'm not going to attempt to do so now. But the Zimbabwean novelist, No Violet Bulawayo, writes that a country is a Coca-Cola bottle that can smash on the floor and disappoint you. What better way to capture Zimbabwe's predicament? The unresolved colonial questions about land and race, the liberators turned oppressors, the earnest efforts at social transformation derailed by jingoism and corruption, the ongoing struggle for human rights marred by political violence and economic meltdown, the country's early accomplishments in health and education eclipsed by the lost potential of entire generations. The crucible in which my selfhood has been formed is the prolonged liminality of living in a post-colonial world, not entirely colonized, while not entirely free of colonization. So my book asks, when will we be free? And I'll have to disappoint you by saying I don't know yet. But I continue to reflect on these words from James Baldwin. History is not merely something to be read and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways. History is literally present in all that we do. So in writing to this book, I've endeavored to take a look at the history I carry within myself. And I hold steadfast to the view that neither I nor any of us can have a sense of ourselves, can hold a vision for the future, can struggle for freedom without first reckoning with the past. And only then can we learn if, how and when to let it go. Thank you.